Good afternoon, guests, and um, welcome to this final session of the festival, what's been an extraordinary series, um, and today's session on Australian landscape into art. Thank you very much, Patrick McCacky, for the very kind invitation to convene today's session, and also to Roz, Jaisal, and the team of the Festival of Ideas for the generous support and assistance. Um, may I first ask everyone, please, just to check their mobile phones, um, as is now protocol. Um, please switch them to silent or off, although I am informed that people are encouraged to tweet to their heart's content, and I, I draw your attention to the, uh, the hashtag FOI2011. It's a great pleasure to welcome this afternoon's panellists, Tom Nicholson, Siri Hayes, Raquel Ormella and Darren Seavies. According to the program, some of you might also have been expecting Ricky Maynard to join us, but unfortunately he had to withdraw only recently. So we're very grateful that Darren Seavies was able to join in um, over the last week um, and also is in Melbourne for the opening of his exhibition at Nellie Caston Galleries, which opened on Thursday. The topic for today's session is Australian Landscape into Art, Contemporary Critiques and Visions of the Landscape which is indeed a rich and interesting subject in our current moment, as the landscape enjoys a renewed interest by a younger generation of artists, following a period in which the representation of the landscape took a back seat or a somewhat marginal position in relation to contemporary art practice. The motif of the Australian landscape has of course tended to dominate art history and its pictorial tradition here in Australia. As a stroll through any of our national collections will comprehensively attest. The landscape is, of course, the most persistent and enduring genre in Australian art, strongly influencing the construction of Australian identity and nationhood, as well as envisaging or visioning notions of property ownership, longing and belonging, and the making sense of a place. I had intended as a backdrop to provide a schematic account or outline of some principal motifs of the Australian landscape tradition but I soon realised that this was too monumental and complex a task for a brief introduction. But I'll nevertheless try to note just a few um, traditions, such as the marvellous traditions of artists who accompanied explorers and survey surveyors, from Joseph Banks to John Woolsey, who we saw this morning, where art has been pressed to the service of scientific discovery and colonial endeavour. And the 19th century drawings of Indigenous artists, such as Tommy McRae, William Barrack and Mickey from Ulladulla, who returned the gaze upon the immigrant settler communities with equal curiosity. As the amazing exhibition of Eugene von Gerard at the NGV shows so vividly, the Australian landscape tradition conjures majestic landscapes seen through the lens of the European romantic imagination. And at the same time, in the survey of land, we see artists reproducing the imperial or magisterial gaze, so that the representation of landscape has also worked in tandem with the appropriation of land and with the idea of possessing inevitably allied to a commensurate dispossessing. In the late 19th century, we see grand pastoral vistas increasingly allied to nationalist sentiment and also regional identification. And in the case of the Heidelberg School, a growing sentiment or love for the bush, which was experienced by an increasingly urbanized community. In the pastoral paintings of the 1920s and 30s, the fleece and gum trees, we see the landscape as emblematic of an industrious national identity. The late great conceptual artist Ian Byrne convincingly describes the way in which popular landscape painting between the First and Second World War was historically coincident with the domestication of the landscape, when the subdivision of rural properties and the parceling up of land under soldier settlement schemes found commensurate aesthetic form in the post-impressionist and cubist dividing up of the picture plane. And we of course have artists such as Sidney Nolan, who successfully maps European abstraction into the narrative space of the Australian landscape, introducing new formal devices into the pictorial tradition. And other more down at hill depictions of drought, remoteness, hardship and alienation, such as in the work of Russell Drysdale, or the surrealist artists who sought to eroticize the landscape, making it strange and unfamiliar. The Australian landscape was considered as possessing a terrible beauty, articulated by Marcus Clarke and elaborated by Bernard Smith, and also with the related term of the idea of wilderness, which is of course a relative term, 
suggesting the perspective of a visitor or interloper for whom the landscape is wild and other. For the landscape was neither wild nor foreign to its original inhabitants, at least not until its transformation through colonising, farming and displacement. More recently, the fecund complexity and the majesty of Western desert painting provides a critical counterpoint to the European vocabulary of the sublime, so that we now understand a much more connected and continuous relationship between the land, people and place, between the elements and the cosmos, and the vibrant assertion of spiritual and cultural relationships to land which have unfolded with the burgeoning of the Aboriginal art movement since Papania. And at the same time um, that Fred Williams was forging a new materiality and authentic vision for the painterly depiction of landscape, which again changed the way we perceive the landscape and our relationship to it, but also the way we reconceive painting, Christo's wrapped coast of 1969 sought to wrap up the landscape, to reconceive the landscape as an object, a ready-made. Although as the work endures in its photographic documentation, it's perhaps the vastness and awe-inspiring character of the landscape which endures and remains primary. And it's also very interesting to, to note the history of the military sculpture triennials and the way in which much conceptual art, performance art, and post-object art in Australia also took place in the landscape. And then, all of a sudden, the landscape seemed to be off the agenda. The demise of the landscape, although probably rhetorical and temporary, of the landscape tradition was perhaps most comprehensively achieved in the context of postmodernism and postcolonialism and ideas associated with postnationalism in the 1980s and 1990s. For many artists over the past two decades, the landscape that we have come to inhabit is of a more abstract character, as the world around us and nature itself is radically transformed by forces of globalisation, the market, design, media, and economics. These became the new horizons and the new technical and theoretical concerns which increasingly entertained the artistic imagination, along with questions of personal rather than national identity. Whilst the allure of the landscape never really evacuated the scene, as the urban and industrial landscapes of John Brack or Howard Arkley or Jan Semberg's or Catherine Hattam and Sean Gladwell attest, in the past few years it's been apparent that artists have again sought to re-engage and to re reconnect with the landscape as a key motif in contemporary art practice, as a means to bring new worlds into being. Many have envisaged the landscape with reference to indigenous and colonial histories as a site of ecological significance or as a way to identify new models of biodiversity, ecological thinking, sustainability and coexistence and also as an opportunity for the experience of an attachment to a place, or a place to tell stories. And this is not surprising given that landscape and environment are as much political and economic as they are cultural considerations today, as suburban sprawl encroaches upon the landscape, as we again increasingly rely on natural resources, on mines and mineral resources, and as interventions into Aboriginal land underscore out outstanding questions of national identity and belonging, and histories of possessing and dispossessing. And we might also argue that in the increasingly abstract, designed and commodified world in which we live, the artistic return to the landscape could also be understood as a desire by artists to engage the irrational and elusive and the energetic sense of nature and to connect in a more sensory way with the world around us. These um, somewhat disorganised and cursory thoughts in no way account for, the or, account for or, or measure up to the work of artists themselves and to what T.J. Clarke last night so beautifully referred to as the extraordinary ordinariness and the compelling immediacy of the landscape genre. So I'm delighted indeed to introduce our four speakers whose work addresses the question of landscape from diverse perspectives and viewpoints. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Tom Nicholson. Tom is an artist and lecturer in drawing at the Faculty of Art and Design at Monash University. His recent exhibitions include Camp Pell Lecture at Art Space in Sydney in 2010 with Tony Birch, who was one of the speakers yesterday. Lines Towards Another Century, presented in Venice and also in Bath in 2009. And Tom has a forthcoming exhibition in August in Melbourne at Anna Schwartz Gallery. 
Tom's recent, recently participated in group exhibitions uh, internationally, including Extra City, Kunsthal in Antwerp, Last Ride in a Hot Air Balloon at the Auckland Triennial 2010, Rehearsal, the 2010 Shanghai Biennale, and his work was also included in the Sydney Biennale of 2006. Tom was a recipient of a creative fellowship at the State Library of Victoria and has twice been a finalist in the Melbourne Prize for Urban Sculpture in 2005 and 2008. Please welcome Tom Nicholson, who will speak on his work entitled Monument for the Flooding of Royal Park, an artist's book and video which provides an opportunity for reflection about the relationship between landscape, monuments and memory. Thank you, Max, for that um, introduction and that framing of the panel. Um, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this conversation, which is slightly daunting after this morning. And thank you, um, John, um, Jan and Catherine, for that fantastic discussion. And particularly daunting after last night's extraordinary lecture by TJ Clark, who's a writer who has been very formative on me from the time that I was really studying in art school. So it was wonderful to hear him talk last night, but slightly daunting to then appear um, behind the same podium as he was last night. Um, I feel like I'm here on slightly false pretenses in, in the sense that I, I would never regard myself as, as a landscape artist. But I want, as Max says, I want to talk about one work in particular which, in a strange way, um, felt like it was, in an inadvertent or unconscious sense, a return to something like a landscape space. And I'll, I want to show you the work first and then just say a couple of things about it. Um, and then just to conclude by saying one thing about the work of another artist. Um, just um, to, before I show you that, that first work, which is just a short video work, a, a kind of preliminary comment about what I would see as a kind of paradox around which what I'm going to say gravitates. Um, and that is that, um, on the one hand, I think our, our idea of Australian art is profoundly indebted to the tradition of landscape. This is self-evident. I mean, to go through the early rooms of uh, Australian art down at the National Gallery of Victoria is to see a sequence of pictures which is utterly dominated by the idea of landscape and the version, different versions of Australian art history that we're taught at school are also dominated in a, in a similar way by the, the tradition of landscape, which is an extremely rich and interesting tradition. I think it's fair to say that that tradition of landscape, that is of making a picture out of the view of a landscape, ha is profoundly um, diminished in its importance as a tradition. And by that I mean that artists rely on tradition in a self-conscious way as fuel. So that in a grand sense in terms of establishing the trajectories in which we work, that we constantly look to the traditions that we're drawn to, but also in a very nuts and bolts sense that when you're trying to solve a particular problem in a particular work, it's often that tradition which gives you the solution. So that self-conscious indebtedness to a tradition, I think, has moved quite radically uh, away from landscape. And that's not to say that there aren't extremely interesting artists who are working in self-conscious relationship to that tradition, because I think they are, and this morning is a very good example of that. I also think that there are lots of artists who make work not in a self-conscious relationship to that tradition, but whose work you can read in relation to landscape in an interesting way. Um, and there's, um, if you go to the ground floor of Federation Square at the moment, you see an extraordinary flowering of uh, something which one could understand as, as landscape. But it's, it's different to the, the, the Western tradition of landscape. And for me, there's a paradox in there between the importance of the tradition in our visual heritage and in our history, and the way that you know I can't encounter that history without landscape, and on the other hand, that contemporary art seems to be sh have shifted away from a self-conscious relationship to that tradition. And so that is a kind of a preliminary remark that's in the background of the, the, the three other thoughts that I want to share with you after I've shown you this work. The work that I want to show you now is called, as Max said, it's Monument for the Flooding of Royal Park, and it's a work which wasn't in any self-conscious relationship to landscape, was actually in self-conscious relationship to another tradition that's possibly even more fraught in a colonial sense than landscape, and that is the monument. Um, and it was in response to a specific site, which is, for those of you who aren't from Melbourne, is very, very nearby here. It's only about a kilometre or two to our north, um, a very strange open space 
um, called Royal Park, which is the only 19th century park in the city that was never landscaped with exotics. And it has a very, I think, mysterious feel because of that, because of its size, but also because it was never subjected to that uh, organising system of the other inner city parks. Um, so the work was a, was a response to that site and what I think is very mysterious about it, and also to this um, strange, very unpromising monument that you see on the screen here, um, which is the monument which marks the point where Burke and Wills began their expedition, which was in uh, Royal Park. I'll play the quick time. Just as a, it's, a, it's, it's silent, um, because the, the, I'm sorry, I, I know this is going to get very boring artists whinging about the slides, but I apologise for the slides. I think John Wolseley said that the better the university is, the worse the slide projector is, and I just didn't know that Melbourne Uni was such a good university. That's all I can say. <laughs> um, but um, it just as a, it was first shown in a glass, in the context of a public sculpture exhibition, um, behind a very large glass window. And so the silence in the video might be understood in relationship to the thing being contained in a glass window in that way.
I, th I think that the, the, the basic narrative and idea of that work is reasonably um, self-evident. As Max mentioned, it's taken a few different forms. It, it also exists as an artist's book, which you can see a double page from there, and it's also been shown as a kind of unfolded um, frieze, which nonetheless borrows from the form of the book. And most recently, it produced um, this offshoot, which is, um, it should be that large indeterminate area is actually a very, very deep red, the red of that Nardu, um, which is a photographic image composited from about a dozen photographs of a Nardu flag, so a flag being imp imprinted with that um, visual appearance of the Nardu being waved in, in Royal Park and that extraordinary vista you get um, overlooking the city skyline. The work, um, as I said, uh, it, it's a work which began really in response to a specific site and also in reaction against the norms of the classical monument and the failures of the classical monument in a way, against that vertical, over-the-top visibility of the monument, that, ex um, that excessive, unequivocal nature of the classical monument which declares its meaning too readily or too fast. So it, it, it partly took shape against those characteristics of the monument. And it did so, like other works that I've made, through a very specific encounter between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in the early history of Melbourne. And in this respect, it followed the cue of um, this work, for example, which is from a couple of years earlier, which is a poster-based work um, which sought to commemorate the moment, the meeting between William Buckley and Batman's camp, which occurs uh, on the 6th of July, 1835, when Buckley and his mother on kin come out of the bush and meet um, the men who have come with Batman to Melbourne and a, a month earlier um, cr concocted the um, Batman's, Batman's treaty. Um, and I guess in, this, in a similar way, this work was partly thought against the permanent monument. So if you think about the characteristics of the classical monument as a way to commemorate a historical event, that the poster would operate in a very different way, which is that rather than that um, overblown permanence of the monument, it would be something that would simply dissolve into the city within a few days. But also that there's something for me interesting in the character of the poster, which fed into the, the um, monument for the flooding of Royal Park, which is that the poster is always something which ad advertises something in the future. So to use that nature of the poster as a way to think our way into the potential of a past event as something which has potentials which are yet to be realised in the same way that a poster is literally always something which is yet, yet to occur. And to sort of link that process of imaginatively entering into the past with the work of somehow envisaging the future differently. So th this was something which um, in partly informed that monument for the flooding of Royal Park in that the structure of the monument is also yet to be in that um, obviously it describes a monument which is a whole lot of um, spores in the ground in Royal Park which in the event of a flooding would produce this extraordinary red effect. So it's the actual visible form is something which is yet to come in the same way that the poster is always about something which is yet to arrive. I guess that the, the main way in which the monument sought to work against its own heritage, my one, was in that it's fundamentally imaginary in character. I mean, it, it adds nothing physically to that site of Royal Park and it instead seeks to do its work through an image in our head that when we walk through that park, we might imagine that there are spores there and we might imagine the presence of that extraordinary red carpet of Nardu um, on that sort of plain or hill before the city. But it's completely uh, imaginary in its character. Um, but that doesn't, it doesn't have any, um, any physicality. And I guess the thing that, and this is where I'm going to, in a very slow way, get to the subject of this panel, is that as I was reflecting on what I might talk about today, it struck me that um, in a funny way, what I ended up with was a landscape space with that monument. I mean, as I attempted to uh, work with those histories and with the heritage of the monument, the thing which, I, which it evolved into was a kind of landscape space in the sense that it's a monument which is completely dispersed um, across the park. It's radically horizontal as opposed to the classic vertical thing of the monument. It's something that we walk among and within. And that's where this, this um, is a still from one of those sequences in the work which is footage which I shot 
a couple of years before I got to making this work in Raw Park on one of those remarkable days when um, there were those extraordinary uh, dust storms produced by bushfires in Victoria. It was the Gippsland bushfires, I think, in that case, which produced this incredible blanket over the city. And I just went up to the park and was filming there because you couldn't see the city anymore. And it, um, it was this extraordinary kind of dusky blue light. And that ended up dropping into the work, I think, partly because it helped me to understand what the space of that monument might be, which is something which saturates you, which is inescapable. There was no way of getting away from that dust storm. And it's something which is not something you walk around. It's something that you're simply within. So the curious thing for me is that in trying to do that work with those histories and against the monument, the place that I felt that I ended up was actually something closer to the tradition of uh, the landscape than um, the monument. And it made me wonder whether there's something in that, that once you step into that terrain of trying to commemorate these collective histories, um, and deal with the way in which we make forms out of them collectively, you actually have to traverse the landscape in some way. So that was, for me, one of those cases where um, an artistic process felt like it yielded something, a discovery which I certainly would, wouldn't have consciously articulated beforehand. Um, I don't know how I'm going for time, Max, but I wanted to make just... Um, th that's the f one thought on that work, and I just wanted to make give you a second thought, which begins with this work, which is, I think, a, a very, very strange late work by John Glover, who's a painter that's been mentioned already today, the great English and Tasmanian artist who came to uh, Van Diemen's Land when he was 64, which I think is in itself is an extraordinary thing. And he made this painting when he's 73. It's a painting of the Swilker Oak, which is uh, a remarkable tree in England, which I think it was famous in uh, Glover's day for being, they thought, about 600 years old and having survived the kind of radical encroachments of the Industrial Revolution in England, and I think he wasn't the only artist who drew it. He made this drawing in the 1790s, and then as an old man in Van Diemen's land, he makes this painting, uh, m remembering this extraordinary form from his previous life in England from the other side of the world. Um, this monumental tree, which in itself is the memory of an extraordinary uh, stretch of time and history. And what I think is curious about it is that as he tries to paint that tree out of that memory, there's a sense in which it is uh, inflected by his Australian work. And so whereas this is undeniably a European tree with this, those branches doing the thing that European trees do, this is like... Um, that idea or vision of that tree, but with that uh, expressive uh, liminess that you get with his depictions of those great um, Tasmanian eucalypt trees. And so there's an extraordinary sense in which in that painting, um, two places assert themselves at once, or one landscape is embedded in another, so that as he tries to conjure the ghost of that tree from his previous life, that attempt is ghosted in turn by the presence of those gum trees in Tasmania. And I, I wanted to pick it out because I think it's an idiosyncratic example, but it's an example of the way in which, particularly in Australia, but possibly this is true of all landscapes, landscapes are rich and interesting because one place is always connected to or embedded in another. We, we, just as when we see an extraordinary picture, part of what happens is we bear all of the pictures that we know already in front of that picture, and the encounter with the new picture we see is an encounter in part between that great pool of pictures we know already and the picture that we have in front of us. And I would say that the landscape is a rich thing for the same reason, that when we encounter uh, a landscape and walk through it, part of what happens is there's an encounter between what's present and singular and before us, and that we try to perceive through the act of seeing. And on the other hand, all the places that we carry within us. And what's rich about a landscape is the way that there's a kind of interchange between those two things. And I think that's, that's true when we are simply in the landscape, but it's very true in the way in which we then picture it, because the picturing is somehow the reconciling of the encounter with all of the things that we bear within us. Um, and I guess I, I wanted to pick that up because that's, I think, part of what became interesting for me about uh, Royal Park as a site. And when I first just started walking around there thinking that I might make a work about it and delved into the State Library picture collection and found all these extraordinary photographs, 
was the sense in which that place is rich as a site because it connects so many different <coughs> places, often places that are very, very uh, miles apart and apparently not connected anyway. And just, uh, just to quickly talk about some of those. Um, okay. um, for example, the way in which that, uh, this is the Royal Park shot from the Royal Children's Hospital, and the way in which the arid openness of that landscape almost seems to anticipate the landscapes that Ludwig Becker made on that Birkin Mills expedition. And he obviously knew the park. He was there when the expedition left. And then there's a strange echoing back from his landscapes, which he made on the trip where he very sadly died. Um, likewise, the Afghan cameleers, who were the first Afghan cameleers to come to Australia for that expedition, <coughs> they were housed at Royal Park in huts with those camels. What did they make of that landscape? When this is John King standing among them um, a few weeks before the expedition actually departs in Royal Park. The, the zoo, obviously, is another case. And Camp Hill, which is the military encampment, um, which was on the side of Royal Park for many, many years, again, with American soldiers who were engaged in the, the conflict um, in, the, in the Pacific, being in the park. And the park, in a way, contains all of these narratives in a very extraordinary way. But also, in a very Australian way, there are no physical, very few physical traces of those stories in the park. In '56, the whole, all of the structures of Camp Hell were packed up and spread all over Melbourne so that there wouldn't be an eyesore there for the Olympic Games. Um, I'll slightly skip through, uh, accelerate, because I want to get to my last um, point, which is about the work of Ian Byrne. But um, just to say that I, what I think the, the monument took its, um, as its main physical form, something which is imaginary. And that was partly a reaction against the monument, and it was partly in tune with what I felt were the, what's extraordinary about that park, which is that there are all these presences and histories there which are only imaginary. They're not physically there. But it was also part of what is a landscape in that place, which is that landscapes are rich because they are <coughs> somehow the inter interconnection between places and histories, that when we walk through a landscape, we're also in some way linking to other places and sites. I might just make, if I whiz through one last point, which is about the work of another artist that, that's already been mentioned a couple of times. I'm sure many of you would know the work of Ian Byrne, who was a Melbourne-trained artist who moved to London and then to New York and became a really important part of international conceptual art and I think is an extremely interesting artist and writer. And I think he's, he's, for me, an interesting point, and this is, goes back to that um, paradox that I mentioned at the very beginning, and that is that he's, on the one hand, an artist who apparently repudiated so many aspects of the Australian art tradition. He left the country, and he works with some of the most radical and interesting conceptual artists working in New York in the early 1970s. But he then, in the late 70s, tries to re-engage with Australia, its political life, and does so in a very interesting way. And the way he, he does it, is, is through landscape. He writes extraordinary articles on Namajira and Williams, and he makes a body of work which very overtly draws on the tradition of the landscape, um, using amateur, in some cases, his own teenage paintings, um, and overlaid with these very interesting texts which meditate on what it is to look at a landscape. So that, for me, he's in an interesting case in point where, although he looks like the kind of artist who would most repudiate that heritage, there's a sense in which in order to do the things he's most interested in, the landscape returns or he returns to the landscape. And I would use just as a, um, a last work to show you <clears throat> this work as, a, as an interesting example. And this actually precedes that whole manoeuvre back to Australia and the overt engagement back with landscape. It's one of his Xerox bo uh, books where he made works by making a photocopy of an image and then photocopying that image and photocopying it and so on and so on until he was left with an image which really was the artefact of the photocopy process. Uh, and there are several different versions of that um, process. But the one that I'm most interested in is this one. Because I, I can't help thinking that in 1969, I think he was in New York at that point, and he made this work, which is partly about eliminating the image and making the artwork only out of the process, this automated process of what a Xerox does to an image. But I'm, I'm, my hunch is that part of what he found interesting about this is actually that it produces a kind of landscape. And I think it's a very particular kind of landscape too because it transforms a photograph of a suburban Australian street into something which looks quite a lot like this. 
And this is, of course, a painting by Fred Williams, who was a, uh, a, a friend of the young Ian Byrne. Ian Byrne worked in the same framing shop as him. This is made in the same year that they knew each other, when Byrne was at art school. And in 1969, the same year as that Xerox book is made in New York by Byrne, Williams <coughs> makes drawings like this. This is a Listerfield uh, landscape drawing. And to me, it's hard to uh, imagine that part of what is present for Byrne is that when he makes this work in New York, what appears through this apparently very dry conceptual process is something which is like a very beautiful echo of this artist that we know he admired very greatly and who painted actually a specific site as well, which is the space between Melbourne and Geelong. And Geelong is where Ian Byrne's from. He would have driven that road hundreds of times in his life. And that all the way in New York, you suddenly get this apparition of the Australian landscape back into the work. And it's both um, a sense, this doubling which you get of the first and last image I think is very beautiful because it's both the sense in which even in a suburban context, that openness of the Australian landscape is present for us. But conversely, that as we try to organise our impression of that landscape, the fact of our urban existence is also present. So there's a constant interplay between two places. And I think um, that's what's one of the things that's very curious about this work. And if I could, uh, this um, uh, festival ideas has identity and landscape together, which in Australian art history is kind of, has a, lots of bad, uh, I think uninteresting art and bad politics often come when those two things try to articulate one another. When artists try to make the landscape be an articulation of nationalism, it usually ends up with either bad politics or very uninteresting art or both. So. And, but conversely, there's a very, you know, this world that is homogenising places so dramatically, there's a very, very understandable and valid desire to articulate what's distinctive about a particular place. And I guess I just wanted to conclude with the possibility that maybe the old way of artic articulating identity through landscape is a difficult zone to enter, but this quality of landscape being always being one place embedded in another or one place being understood through its relationship to another is perhaps a way in which we can understand identity without that chauvinism of the old tradition that we could conceive of identity as being about, not about uh, an impervious um, monolith, but rather in our relationships with a whole lot of other places in the same way that landscape is rich because it's never just one place. It's always one place in relation to another. Um, thanks very much, Tom. Um, that's a wonderful, I think, um, opportunity for us to really consider one of the themes I think this afternoon will be indeed the idea that in multiple landscapes and histories residing in the one place I think will become a recurring motif. Um, it now gives me great um, pleasure to introduce Siri Hayes. Siri Hayes is an artist who works primarily as a photographer. Um, her depictions of the landscape are shaped by a keen eye and also a memory for art historical representations from the picturesque genres of landscape painting and the sublime characteristics of um, the romantic imagination, but also with a watchful eye on the environmental impact of urban and industrial encroachment on the landscape. Siri has held reg regular solo shows in Australia, including at the CCP in Melbourne, University of Sydney, Monash University Museum of Art, as well as regularly at Gallery Smith and Grant Peary in Melbourne and Sydney, respectively. Um, Recent group exhibitions include Stormy Weather, Contemporary Australian Photography at the National Gallery of Victoria, and Contemporary Australian Portraits at the National Portrait Gallery, alongside other group exhibitions in Japan, Finland, Poland, and France. Siri has been the recipient of the Olive Cotton Award for Photographic Portraiture, an Australian Career Foundation travelling grant, and was recently the recipient of an Australia Council residency in Barcelona in Spain. Um, please welcome Siri Hayes. Um, I wanted to say thanks um, to Max uh, for inviting me to come and talk. It feels like quite a big honour and um, it's been a pretty amazing festival so far. Um, so in my presentation, I want to show you a bit of work I've done before, uh, how it came to be and, and the thinking behind it. And I also, hopefully, if I can speed through it quickly enough, want to sh uh, share uh, my current ideas about how interconnected I think place and identity are with landscape and how these might translate into some new work. So, um, I've got some daggy um, dot points, but 
um, merrily, merrily down the stream some things I think about landscape. So when I was asked to talk about it, um, these were some of the things that came to mind. Um, generally that an, a landscape is kind of a, uh, an open expanse of natural vegetation that is framed as a landscape and how much this relates to, um, I guess, cultural conditioning in that... Um, oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, excuse my husky voice as well. I've got a... Uh, losing my voice slightly. Um, yeah, so I, I guess in terms of my work, I would be thinking about... Um, it, I just find it interesting that I can frame a work um, and it can kind of somehow refer just through the, the, the composition to um, um, sort of 17th through to 19th century landscape, European uh, landscape tradition. Um, so the other point is probably uh, what histories are attached to a particular place and how do people relate or identify with, with that place because of that history. I tend to find that the more I know about a particular place, the more interesting it becomes. Um, and a major concern also in my work is um, ecological decline. Um, uh, the next point is kind of a little bit difficult to, to explain, but I hope it comes through in, when I show you the actual work. But um, I kind of like the, the jarring bits um, when I'm making an artwork. So I'm looking at a scene and there's, there's things that sort of don't seem like they should go together, but because of the way you can compose the, the scene, they kind of somehow relate to each other. Or what, maybe it's something to do with nature taking over and there's sort of some kind of natural relationship that sh shouldn't be in harmony, but kind of is. Not sure if that makes sense. Um, and then the last point would be um, the experience of um, a place and, and how do I translate that into an image? Um, you know, like perhaps where I was, there's lots of birds twittering, there might have been the sound of traffic, all these kinds of, se all these sensory experiences that you have and how do you translate that along with everything else that you want to say about interpreting a landscape into a, a work, what do you kind of emphasise in it? Um, so this work um, probably started me on this, this landscape-y bent in my practice. It took it about maybe 10 years ago. Um, and basically it came about because I was house-sitting a friend's place in um, Northcote, uh, which is quite close to the city. Um, and I walked out the front door and, and um, I kind of was overcome by this scene, you know, had a sublime experience, I suppose. Um, that there was a beautiful big tree canopy um, with all these uh, willows and, and other um, kind of weeds, basically. And, um, and then there was this, this people uh, underneath, uh, quite overwhelmed, quite dwarfed by this incredible scenery. Um, and I just liked the way they were sort of just participating in really casual conversation. I felt like, rather than it being like a painting, I suppose, when I saw it, it felt more like I'd walked in on a, um, a theatrical uh, production, like a, a stage production of some, some, something going on, that there was a narrative unfolding or there was some kind of drama, but it was kind of at odds slightly, perhaps, with the casualness of the conversation. So all these things I was thinking about when I saw this scene and I realised I really wanted to make an artwork about it. Um, so I restaged it and I, I had my mother, who's a music composer, on the left-hand side holding some manuscript like she's maybe perhaps the narrator and she is addressing the, the viewer or um, the audience. And then I just had my partner and my grandfather sort of engaged in this um, ca casual conversation. Um, so pretty quickly I realised that the Mary Creek... Um, it was very, like a very fertile place for me to make artwork. Um, and I think it's because of those jarring bits that I was talking about before. And those jarring bits, I suppose, would be the way all these weeds and all this rubbish comes together into this kind of beautiful wilderness. And I feel like that that was quite, um, they were quite, um, I guess, uh, contrasting or contradictory elements. So, you know, have all the rubbish beautifully draped in the, in the, the trees. And um, it's from recent flood, so all of a sudden it becomes quite beautiful. And um, I know my sister said that she, who's a drawer, said she would really like to draw um, this rubbish in this landscape. So, uh, yeah, so I found that kind of interesting. Yeah, so pretty much um, the other thing with this Mary Creek um, area is I felt like um, it's wild, but it's introduced wild weeds. Um, 
and how that could ignite my imagination, I think, because of those oppositions. Um, I created this work while I was doing a, <coughs> a residency at um, Monash Gippsland campus in the Latrobe Valley. And I'd had this idea for quite a while, um, quite a few years before I made this work. I, I love it when you come across uh, Sunday amateur painters out um, painting the scenes. And I thought it would be an interesting idea to, to gather a bunch of these um, Sunday painters together and. Um, have them interpreting a landscape and hopefully through that photograph would show how I was interpreting a landscape as well. So that there's, there's I guess there's multiple possibilities for a landscape um, from one place, multiple interpretation I suppose. Um, so I asked the drawing teacher up there, um, Tony Henning, whether I could um, take a, a drawing class out and he said there was a, a life drawing class, a first year life drawing class I could take out and if I wanted the life model who was male, that would be a possibility as well. So um, yeah, I trooped up with these, this class and I, you can't really tell, um, but if you saw the photograph, there's a lot of detail and I quite like that these first years, you know, they're quite basic drawings. You know, they're not kind of this incredible um, interpretation of this landscape and I, I guess, when the male model came up, I don't know how I thought of it, but I just thought it would be quite fun to put him on a tree stump um, <laughs> in, in this pose. Um, and I guess if you all know the painting, you probably can't see the detail, but I always think about this painting by um, Caspar David Friedrich. Um, and I, I'm poking fun at it, but I love this kind of painting as well. I know there's a lot kind of wrong with it, but the sort of sense of awe of nature, um, I find kind of interesting and possibly quite problematic, particularly today. So I thought it would be interesting to um, pose him in the same way, looking out over a very scarred landscape. Um, and I, and this, this particular landscape, I suppose, when I'm talking about different histories attached to it, became more interesting. Like, I was really interested in the foreground that it was an old homestead. And, and I was thinking at the time, oh, you know, John Walsley would love this particular, the particular space. To, and then I found out it, when I showed the work, one of his students from the 70s came up to me and said, we used to go up there with red wine and <laughs> um, do exactly this. So I was, I was amazed. Like, it was one of those incredible um, coincidences. But um, to think of him and, and then, I don't know, was there a ghost? I don't know. But anyway, um, yeah, so you can't really see it in the slide, but in the, in the distance, there's the there's the smokestacks of the power plant. So I think that's probably what was interesting about this particular landscape. And I think probably for most of the landscapes I look at, um, that, yeah, that, that I'm looking at something where there's um, some kind of environmental uh, degradation. Um, uh, when I made the Merry Creek series, uh, a friend, uh, Tom Holloway, uh, who's a playwright, was making, uh, creating a work about John Batman. And he told me, after I'd, just after I made the work, that where I'd shot that Mary Creek series was very well where John Batman could have, and pro pro most probably signed a treaty with the local Indigenous people, renting uh, Melbourne um, from them. Um, I don't think that actually became any, um, any particular paper in the end. It was disregarded. But I felt like um, it was quite obvious and I really wanted to acknowledge some kind of Indigenous presence in, in my work. And so when I made this work, or when I was making this particular body of work up at the Latrobe Valley, um, I, I wanted to bring that into the work somehow. So I um, was speaking with a PhD student up there, Wayne Thorpe, who was doing his PhD in Indigenous dance. And I asked him whether he'd want to come out and um, collaborate on a piece and um, create a work. So he's down in the bottom right hand corner. I didn't direct him. I didn't really feel like I knew how to direct him. So he just created this dance on the spot for the fallen gum tree, which I just thought was, um, I, I love the spontaneity of it, I suppose. But I really wanted to show um, just these different layers to the landscape. So we've got all the introduced blackberries and then we've got the <coughs> um, fallen gum tree, we've got introduced pine trees and there's very ominous, quite on the set, quite close on the horizon line, the, the power plants. Um, so this is work I've sort of made in the last couple of years with my mother, um, music composer Eve Duncan, and um, we were looking at dredging of Western Port um, and Port Phillip Bays. And the main work I want to show you from this um, is a, a, a video piece. It goes for 10 minutes, but I'm only going to show a couple of minutes. And it 
um, basically we looked at the environmental effects report um, of how the dredging was going to affect um, the bay in general, and um, of Port Phillip Bay in particular, and uh, basically the tides are now higher than they used to be and lower than what they used to be before the dredging. So my mother made this quite um, complicated um, musical piece um, that looked at the difference between those um, tides to create rhythm. So that became the audio for the piece and then during making this work I heard this incredible uh, welcoming speech by um, Bunurong elder uh, Carolyn Briggs and I just couldn't, couldn't help be amazed at how relevant it was to, to today. And basically what she was saying was that um, thousands of years ago, um, the people were um, in disharmony with the landscape, with the land, with the people. They were fishing at the wrong time of the year during the fish um, spawning season, those kinds of things. So um, the sea became angry and started to rise. And I was like, oh, sounds familiar. Um, and so the people went to Bunjil and said, oh, how do we, how do we make the sea the sea recede, we need to fish, we need to farm this, this, um, this landscape. And um, so Bunjil said that you need to uh, respect the landscape and you also need to create harmony between the different tribal groups. So that's when the big tribal um, gatherings, intertribal gatherings um, became a part of um, this area's history thousands of years ago. Um, so I, had, I contacted Carolyn Briggs and she um, appears in this video and um, she basically tells this story, but you don't hear it. I sort of feel like it's somehow embedded in the video. I'm not quite sure if it really is. But when we exhibited it last year, we had the story up on the wall so you could read it. So that sort of gave you more uh, background to it. So I'm trying to remember how it goes. I think that's it. Thank you. Press play. Oh, and I have to press play. Thank you. Okay, so basically with that film, I, I just felt like there was a lot of uh, ancient wisdom that was quite applicable to today, so I felt like it would make an interesting piece. Um, so the last little bit that I'm going to try and whiz through super quickly um, is like um, maybe an imaginary future potential artwork that I could make. Um, and uh, ceramic goblets and socks with sandals, there's a place called Eltham. Um, could be the title, I'm not quite sure. Um, We've just moved there recently, about six months ago, a little bit longer than that. But just after we moved there, we went to Spain for three months. So when I came back, it was quite interesting, this experience of our new place. And I grew up around that area, and I don't know if everyone knows, but Eltham's sort of further out, northeast of Melbourne. 
it's known for probably its um, many gum trees, mud brick houses, alternative um, artist communities. Um, and I just felt like it would be interesting. Um, I just felt like I had fresh eyes. So basically when I came back, um, uh, Rosemary Lang had this exhibition on at Tolano Galleries, which is, I don't know if anyone saw it, but it was quite um, incredible. And it, it really reflected how I felt, which was everything was a bit topsy-turvy. And one of the main things I felt weighed on my conscience when I came back was this sense of having to drive everywhere and that not being quite right. Um, particularly if you move out to these areas. I think the sense of space in Australia is quite interesting. There's like, seems lots of breathing space, and lot, um, but it seems almost like it's a waste. And I, I find it very interesting in, these, in this urban sprawl kind of aspect of things. So I've done quite a... I would never usually do this if I made an artwork, but I did it for, for you guys. Um, um, I, I did a Facebook survey. <laughs> Um, what comes to mind when you think of Eltham. I just thought it'd be interesting to get everyone um, just immediate um, ideas of what people felt like um, about Eltham. So that's the, that's the first um, branch <laughs> of my um, mind tree for potential new work. And then the next branch is like how I feel in this new place and some of the things I've been thinking about. Probably the main one has been urban sprawl and the sense of a lot of alternative people being in that area and probably being ecologically minded. Um, but the contradictions involved with that kind of lifestyle, I suppose. Um, and then the other main point, I'm not going to go into it too much, was basically um, the lead light stained glass window that's um, a feature beside our front door. And at first it was like, I want to get rid of that. Um, it's got the kingfisher diving into the, um, into the <coughs> native flower. But in the end, um, I found that some other friends that have moved into here, they've also got a feature lead light window. And I was like, there's probably something really interesting in that. And there's the uh, local lead light co-op, um, which I might contact about that. And that could be potentially become an element of the work. So anyway, just wrapping it up quite quickly, um, my final branch is what it potentially could be. So maybe it might be lead light. I quite like the idea of it being kind of utopian in that sort of post hippie commune folk art, because apparently it is the ceramic heartland of Melbourne. Um, I think there could be lots of leaves and it could potentially be purple and mauve. That's it. Thanks. <laughs> Um, thanks very much, Siri. Um, the, um, the complex relationship between the experience of a place and its representation um, is you know, very strongly felt in your work, and I think it's also a great opportunity to introduce Raquel Ormella. Um, Raquel works across um, a whole range of media, including drawing, video, painting, installation, and zines. Um, a mid-career survey of her work was held last year in Sydney at Artspace. Um, and her work has also been shown in a whole range of prestigious exhibitions uh, internationally, including the 2008 Sydney Biennale, the 2003 Istanbul um, Biennale, the San Paolo Biennale in 2002, and more recently in an exhibition called Making It New, Focus on Contemporary Australian Art at the MCA in Sydney. Raquel is a lecturer and PhD student at the School of Art at the ANU, and was a winner of the Fletcher Jones New Social Commentaries Award at Warren Art Gallery in 2005. Um, her presentation today will include an excerpt from a recent work entitled Aerial Scan 2010, which provides a very sensory, haptic, and quite embedded experience of the landscape as she reflects upon conservation models and issues which have inspired her, including those of environmental activism and the relationship that they have to her art practice. That's on mute, isn't it? The... If I mute it, can I mute it here? Yeah. Is it muted? Sorry. The sound's off, isn't it? Oh, so I can, you mean control here? Yeah. yeah.
To get to the Styx Valley, you take the Lyle Highway out of Hobart that goes along the lower reaches of the Derwent River. When the far edges of Hobart disappear, you spend some time going through farming country and woodland patches till you turn into the Gordon River Road. This road will eventually take you to Lake Pedder and the southwest, but way before the lake, before you even get to the Styx Valley, you will drive through the picturesque cluster of cherry orchards and hop fields that make up Bushy Park. Continuing along the Gordon River Road, after you pass west away, there is a small family-owned sawmill on your right. On your left is the Styx Road, the main logging road that winds up the Styx Valley. As with many logging roads, at the beginning there is a locked gate. Um, this is the start of the narration that accompanies the video installation Walking Through Clearfells that I made in 2009 and 2010. The work is a video installation in two parts. One is the single channel being screened behind me. Um, I made the work with Tasmanian cinematographer Joe Shemesh, and it's filmed using a red camera, which is a very high resolution digital camera. So um, you're not quite seeing it at the resolution that it's, it's, it's made for, but anyway. Um, okay, as the helicopter is able to negotiate the hilly terrain, sorry, uh, in this channel, the camera tracks across the Styx and Florentine valleys, following the first, the Styx Road, and then the Gordon River Road. As the helicopter is able to negotiate the hilly terrain, it reveals coops hidden from the view of the highway by hills and rises. It reveals how narrow and small the uncleared areas of forest are, and in particular, it reveals the network of roads, undeclared logging tracks, public roads that have been closed to traffic because of logging trucks, and the highway which funnels tourists and locals through the disputed area to the Alpine National Parks. These roads, logging coops, and destroyed forest reveal not only the level of destruction, but also the construction of wilderness and or high value conservation areas as remote and untouched by human habitation. The second part is a synchronised double channel of two people, myself and Joe Shemesh, walking through a series of clear fells in the Styx and Florentine valleys. The camera again points directly down and captures our feet and the ground immediately around us. At first, it is not clear what kind of landscape this is. However, with accumulative viewing, an endless horror emerges. One clear fell is muddy and churned up by the machinery. A second is after firebombing and is black like a forest fire, except for the hard, sharp lines of fallen timbers and giant tree stumps. And the third is a recently cut coop with, littered with many waste rainforest timbers. Um, this is the recently cut coop that you're seeing now. As the camera is strapped directly to our chests and the footage, contains the the footage therefore contains the motion of our, as our bodies sway and struggle with the uneven ground, there is no horizon, and this claustrophobic view creates nausea and disorientation within the viewer. Um, the two channels are usually, or the three channels are usually exhibited at right angles to each other. Walking through Clearfells was motivated by a desire to describe the landscapes of the tall forests of Tasmania and their current destruction. While there are many photographs of Clearfell logging used in activist campaigns, I felt these representations did not capture the visceral feeling of loss and destruction. Neither do they adequately capture the scale of individual logging coops and the way these coops effectively form a honeycomb pattern of deforestation across vast valleys. Rather than using a perspectival view created, creating sweeping vistas over destroyed forests, I believed um, which those those sorry, <laughs> those sweeping vistas over destroyed forests that I believed would invoke a feeling of the catastrophic sublime. I instead employed a directly pointing down camera, which I hoped would turn the viewer's eye into a scanner-like machine, so that the view seemed dispassionate and objective, and yet it would disrupt the picturesque tradition that connotes ownership and control. Because of the disorientation of both the aerial and the walking footage, the work evokes a very physical and emotional response in the body and the mind of the viewer. Um, it's interesting while filming this that when wearing the red camera, which is actually quite large and very heavy, um, you, it actually felt like it was you, you, you were turned into a machine ourselves and, and then reading back the, um, winding back and watching the footage, it kind of emphasised that. 
The two parts walking through Clearfells together form a macro and a micro view of the Styx and Florentine valleys. It's funny looking at this landscape from the air. Even though I know this space, there is still a way in which what I know doesn't quite connect with what I'm seeing from above. There was a lot of logging activity when we filmed this in early 2010. The weather had been so bad for 12 months that the summer logging season was quite intense. Although you wouldn't necessarily know that looking at this footage. The helicopter and pilot we hired belonged to the same company that forestry uses to drop incendiaries onto clearfells to start fire in the, the autumn months. Forestry burned them to stop the rainforest species regenerating, thereby facilitating the growth of a more profitable monoculture of eucalypts that will be harvested for paper in 20 years. The pilot did not want to fly over clearfells that contained working machinery, despite the company and forestry agreeing to the requested route. And so in 20 minutes of footage, you only glimpse two cranes at the edge of the frame. Instead of documenting the valley busy with people, this landscape looks once both occupied and strangely empty. Um, there are a few ideas that I want to briefly raise in relation to this work today that concern artist position and voice in artworks that are motivated by conservation concerns, rather than discussing this work in relation to national or regional narratives. Um, I should say at this point that I have no familial connection with Tasmania, and while I have visited often in the last eight years, I have never lived there. I am also not a long distance walker, and the only landscape I know intimately is the Styx Valley. I have, in fact, spent more time in Clearfells than in forests, and I actually find the tall, closed forests quite frightening. Um, for those who are not in the conservation, um, participating in conservation movement, that's People always ask if you what your connection is to the place that you're, um, particularly in Tasmania, but doesn't make, which doesn't often get asked in other in other campaigns. Uh, my work is like many mainlanders who are interested in the environmental campaigns in Tasmania, as as much as that I am interested in the campaign to save the Kimberley and the Queensland Wild Rivers from resource explosion. Ex, ex, resource exploitation. Conservation campaigns are often focused on making present the unseen complexity of the natural world, evoking both the wonder of nature and the horror of its destruction and potential loss. The motivation of environmentalists to depict and give voice to the unknown or the known unknowns by revealing the complex entanglement of human values and exploitation of nature is particularly evocative and attractive to artists. I contend that this is because these projects, these are projects where the questions raised by representation and documentation are central and that these are questions asked in interesting and dynamic ways by artists and artworks. Furthermore, environmental projects have an increasing sense of urgency which crea creates for the artist a sense of, or actualizes, being engaged with the world. Uh, this is the burnt um, Clearfell, which is on Mueller Road in the Styx Valley. Uh, detailed and expert knowledge is highly valued within environmental campaigns, whereas a cliché about artists is that they work from the position of not knowing. Although I think this is actually perpetuated by artists as a way of avoiding having to put into words that which sits outside language, i.e. the sensation and effect created by visual artworks. Working as an artist in relation to conservation raises questions then about how to negotiate communicating important information while not being didactic or taking up an authoritarian position. I ask myself, in what ways can the artwork I might make give space for the viewer's experience? And I, I don't necessarily think I might have answered that with this work or any other works I make, but I, I guess that's the kind of question I'm asking in the studio. In looking for potential models to address this problem of a not knowing expert, I have been looking at the writings and artworks associated with post-conceptual practice. And we could you know, possibly say that both Tom and Shiri's work would, would um, fit in that category. Post-conceptual practices are crossed and multidisciplinary that focus on the process of making before the production of artwork. They emphasize, 
emphasise connectivity between artists, subjects, artworks and audiences, and often seek to employ artwork in the service of educating audiences in relation to politics and sometimes the environment. Gracios Karin describes these artists as cultural producers, sometimes social gladfly, researcher, performer, writer, filmmaker, curator, collaborator, and occasionally fabricator of objects. When an object was chosen for the communication medium, these artists avoided high production values and exhibited context, the site of display, as an intrinsic component of the work. Moreover, their productions relentlessly questions how we might approach and understand truth. Often post-conceptual artworks, um, or those we might describe as such, are practicing a kind of institutional critique, uncovering biases in museums and their collections, or um, in uncovering past and outdated thinking in relation to the types of items collected or informed or, or the information attached to those objects. Post-conceptual artists often mine archives for alternative narratives or organise tours of ignored or potentially politically potent sites, often asking non-artists, i.e. holders of other expert knowledges or marginalised cultural groups, to speak on these tours. Often installations seem like a collection of documents, an artwork one might read, interdispersed with things that might be artworks. I find these um, attractive, or this way of working attractive, as a potential way to negotiate the not knowing expert. Although, in relation to discussing remote and unpictured landscapes, I don't see them as a practical solution. Instead, I think of walking through Clearfells as part document and part artwork. The aerial channel is an important document of a landscape being exploited, and I am open to its potential to, in being used in other ways and other contexts, although I'm not sure how useful that is, or it is. Um, in the context um, of this document being an, act, an artwork, the narrative, read by myself, describing an alternative way of moving through the landscape, and the process of making the film is an important self-reflexive element that is being added to by other voices. Peter Hay, um, a social geographer from Tasmania, recently saw the film and is writing um, another narrative which is describing his attempts at writing an essay called um, The Aesthetics of Clearfells. And this also invites the viewer to, to construct their own narrative or sequence or memory of visiting that landscape. The walking feet, in a sense, is the clear artistic interpretation of landscape and belongs to the tradition of artists walking, such as Smithson, Long and Fulton. I just want to show you a little bit of inhabited space, if we've got a moment, just to get that. Well, not inhabited, but just the um, stack of logs. A, I had to include the glitch because the pilot would only fly over once. So we couldn't actually, <laughs> there was like, there's a glitch. It's like, couldn't get a second take. So anyway, that's why some of this is a little bit jumpier than you might experience in the cinema. This is just the World Heritage Area. There's a sequence with that, okay. This footage is taken at the end of summer and you can see the guy lines threading one tall tree to the next. The guy lines create a network between the protesters in tree sits and the platform at the top of the eucalypt regnans. They are there so that if the police try to evict one platform or cut it down, they will pull off the other protesters. It's a way of slowing down and delaying the police breakup of the camp. The camp was evicted the previous autumn. It was before the coop, which you see now, is being, uh, had been logged. This camp now blockades the logging road in an effort to stop it turning off to the right and going deeper into the Florentine Valley. The last section of this footage is where the helicopter has passed the camp and into the World Heritage Area, they have turned around and are filming as they are flying back towards the camp. As you cross the highway, there is some relief that there is no sign of logging activity. The helicopter passes over a heath landscape of tea tree thickets and then forest. 
The film ends where you start to enter Tor Forest again. Right at its edge, there is a road. Thanks, Raquel. Um, I think the motif of traversing the landscape um, has been something we saw this morning in John Wolseley's work and in Tom's radical horizontality of the monument and indeed in, um, in Raquel's walking through the Clearfell Forest. Um, Darren Seavies is an artist whose work also seeks to traverse, um, I guess, multiple times and spaces. Um, Darren is a photographer. Um, he is an artist of both Indigenous and Dutch descent. Um, he was awarded a Sam Stagg uh, Visual Arts Scholarship in 2002, um, completed a, an MA at the Chelsea School of Art in London in 2003, and has held regular exhibitions both at Greenaway Gallery, Gallery in Adelaide and at Nellie Caston in Melbourne, where his current exhibition, <coughs> Dalabon Daylock, um, opened on Thursday and is on for the next three or four weeks. Um, Darren's also presented solo exhibitions in New York and Spain, as well as participating in group shows in Prague, Belfast, Jakarta, the Netherlands, and in 2009 in the Havana Biennial in Cuba. Darren today um, will be speaking on three bodies of work he's created over the past decade, which bring together both indigenous and European perspectives on the landscape and considers the idea of the landscape's relationship to memory, identity, and place. Please welcome Darren Seavies. Thanks, Max. Um, I guess I'd like to start from the beginning of my practice uh, as an artist, um, which really is not the beginning, but it's actually, um, I guess it's the last uh, quarter of my life so far. Um, I, I guess I can't, one thing I can't do is disassociate identity with uh, landscape, and identity has become more uh, crucial not as something that is uh, unassociated to landscape, but as actually integral, integral uh, to landscape. Um, and I guess one of the things that it, throughout my teenage um, life, I, I started to uh, get more of a sense of um, who I was and the environment that I was in. Um, and what became evident was that uh, my identity uh, was being placed as an Aboriginal person. Uh, and I say that because um, it was being placed is because from my point of view, I, I am a multicultural Australian. Um, my mother's background is uh, she has, has an Aboriginal mother who is part Philippine and her father is Russian. And so therefore, um, her identity as an Aboriginal person is really not totally correct, whereas uh, in, in for my identity, it's, it's more than that because my father was a, a Dutch immigrant. And so for me, in my mind, I see myself as definitely a, uh, a multicultural Australian. And um, to, to make it even more complex, my Aboriginal identity is really from the Northern Territory in central Arnhem Land at a place called Wimol. Um, and I've lived in Adelaide uh, for all but a year of my life. So that, in one sense, my identity to the landscape or to the scape is, is to Adelaide uh, in, in the majority of it all. But uh, as I live on, on Ghana land, my identity uh, to the landscape is a, a somewhat a, a disconnected, but um, there is an identity to, to Ghana land. Or, um, and how this kind of relates to where I was and where, I, where, where my place, um, where I reside, is that as an Aboriginal person, um, people saw me as a, as a Ghana person, which, which is not true. I'm of Dullabon descent, um, or an open descent, um, which is kind of around the same sort of area in the central Arnhem Land. Um, and I started noticing that uh, here I was, I, I, I was completing a degree in, 
in visual arts and I was being introduced everywhere as uh, of an Aboriginal artist when, as, as I said, I, I saw myself as really an Australian artist. And that whole concept of, of, of identity in relation to where I was as an artist, um, it just led me to say, why, why is that? Is it, you know, my features? But then again, I, I think, you know, from uh, it's given my multicultural heritage, I still... Uh, found that difficult, um, but understandable. Um, so I started creating a series called Misperceptions um, where I, I literally placed my identity into the landscape and into familiar surroundings, such as a monument, uh, where a monument is really uh, a beacon of, I guess, uh, I guess, people who have lived there before and who have sig significantly contributed to that particular region. And in my earlier works, I looked at um, uh, doing these, sim uh, these somewhat transparent images that were appearing, um, and I call that intertemporality, um, which was allowed me to live in the moment, but also uh, to somehow represent going back or going forward. It's kind of like uh, if you have a, um, if I had a glass in front of me, um, I would not be able to physically occupy the space of the glass, but as soon as I take it away, I can occupy the space, and before the glass was there, I can occupy the space. And it's kind of like intertemporality for me was to live in all spaces, in all times, at, at the same time. And how that relates is that uh, when I see works like John Brack's uh, Collin Street, um, 1955, I notice the absence of multicultural Australia in that image. And to me, intertemporality would allow me or allow a multicultural Australia enter into that image, transform the image completely and give it totally new meaning. And it's all about, for me, transforming ideas and perceptions or challenging ideas and perceptions and letting people uh, um, bring new meaning to a landscape or to escape. And in that series, um, I, I, I did a range of things. I, as I said, I lived in Adelaide. So to me, living um, in that particular environment, familiar, uh, I guess, buildings existed as part of the escape. We have very much the blue stone building. And to me, uh, I, I wanted to have strong representation of that, but still have this idea of, of intertemporality. Um, I didn't just deal with with I guess the landscape, but very much an urban <coughs> landscape in, in, in all of that. And I guess to, uh, I was challenging people to look beyond the physically evident, um, to look beyond the physical features uh, and to see something more. And uh, that's pretty much what <laughs> Misperceptions was about. Um, very much looking at the landscape, where I was, who I was, and how I relate to that. But um, in all of that, my, I guess it, it was the very beginning of my practice and it was really only at a very surface level of, of where, where I was. Um, when I think of identity, even that was at very much at a very much a surface level. And the landscape, my relation to it was very much at a surface level. And I say that is because as I've gone along, and I, I will show it in my more later works, um, Ghana land, which is where I stood, was very much Ghana land. And by me standing in that particular place, there is no real connection with it and no understanding of the meaning of being in that country was. Even if it's built up, even if there's a, an urban building. Um, so that's, that's where I, I had started to move towards and becoming more, uh, I guess, culturally aware of place and what is place and how identity is mixed up in place. And I guess for me, from that point, um, knowing that, that my identity, um, which everyone knew me as an Aboriginal artist, was very much based on a, 
on, on a physical thing, uh, people would look at me and, and say, oh, you're an Aboriginal person, aren't you? Or they wouldn't necessarily have to say it. That y y that's what they thought. Um, and one thing that, in, as an Aboriginal person, that I've never been able to, in an Australian context, escape that identity. So um, I guess if, if my skin uh, was, uh, was white, if my uh, face was slightly, had a different nose, uh, I would probably blend in a little more and my identity is a little more obscure. And having an obscure identity uh, would mean that uh, my, uh, I guess where I'm placed in is, is somewhat different. Now, I fully em embrace, I don't want people to get the wrong idea, I fully embrace my identity, uh, and, but I, I embrace all of my identity, but I embrace my, my Aboriginal identity. And what, but what I wanted to know, what would it be like uh, to be in a position that I'd never been before of having an identity that is different? And my time in, in London was a bit about trying to uh, find out what that's like. So in the next body of work, um, I, I looked at um, putting my identity in an Australian context and having me up at the front, because that's how people sort of uh, viewed. But in the same sort of body of work, I had uh, a female figure uh, in the front, and that was photographs throughout Europe and London, and looking at where my identity was somewhat obscured, my Aboriginality was totally hidden. Um, and yet other parts of my identity could shine through. My identity as a Dutch person uh, was more evident over in a, in a European context, um, which I have very strong connections to my uh, uh, family in, in, in the Netherlands. So there were images where I had these masks, and the masks were a bit about hiding some of the predominant features that make up my identity in the landscape and where I belonged. But again, in these particular images, living in the landscape that I was in um, was very much at a superficial level because I hadn't really come to grips of what land and what um, being in that land actually meant. And, um, and it wasn't until I, I, I got to a body of work, which is a bit about um, uh, looking at, I guess, uh, the, uh, the Aboriginal head of state instead of our current head of state and the connotations of the side profile. Uh, I, I saw an image of a, um, an, ethnographic, an ethnographic image of an Aboriginal person, very, uh, um, the, the, the savage look and what that brought. But yet, I'd also noticed at the same time that the Queen had a very much a side profile but the associations with that meant different things. And it wasn't how this relates to landscape, um, was I noticed that the people that I photographed in these weren't people from my area. These were people from down uh, around in, in, in the southern part of Australia, and they all have uh, different features. They have uh, different ways of looking at things. And um, I guess what I, I wanted to do is to, what would it be like if I actually did a body of work where I was able to go to my own country? And, and that's primarily where I went to. And hence the, the, the beginning of the Dullabon Dalak, which is um, Dullabon woman. And it's also, there's also extensions to this series which are still in, in, in construction, where there's Dullabon Binning, which is Dullabon Man. Uh, in relation to land, um, this is my country. Or how can I say it? This is my, uh, it's, it's Dullabon, um, it's woman's country in Dullabon country. And therefore, when in going through this land, my, I was very cautious, became very cautious of where I was, where I was standing. Um, and that, uh, that there was strong significance that they, these, uh, my rela relations in Delavon country had to this particular land. And uh, for me, uh, it became much more aware that there's a the stronger connection, even though over the years, the understanding of, of land and the meaning of land and the meaning of country um, was so different to, to more than a superficial level that it actually, to, to unassociate 
identity with landscape was um, w was wrong, and uh, that uh, and also to understand that cosmos, to understand that land, and to understand that identity were all connected. And so, for Dullah and Dalek, I was looking at um, their relationship and how they related to the land, and that was, if particularly their country. It was. In, in going into this country, if I had, if I was to look to their left, and photographed out that way, that would be sacred country, and I wouldn't have been able to photograph that. Or um, if I was to go around to the right a bit more, I couldn't do that because that would be man's country, and there'd be just around the bend from there would be sacred country again, and so there were very strong limitations on what I could do, where I could photograph, where I couldn't and what I'm supposed to know about that, how I'm supposed to walk through that. And there's all strong spiritual relationships in all of that. And I guess that's um, what became evident uh, in relating to, to that. With these particular images, I've actually uh, layered, I guess, Western construct of, um, I guess, perfection, of Vitruvian man, of um, perfect form, of... Uh, cosmic uh, co uh, of the cosmos and the relationships and uh, the idea of the perfect number all related from the Fibonacci sequence. How that has I guess been layered over top and how even though that we don't have e even though that, that uh, um, our relationship to, to land is, is perhaps different to, to our Dullabon relationship to land that there are similarities, that there are beliefs, and that it all somewhat interconnects. And uh, I just, uh, for, for Dullabon Dalek, and for all the other series that I'm doing around the Dullabon, um, that, is, that is primarily where I'm, I'm heading towards. So, um, it, is, it is, and it wasn't, it's not just about what I'm photographing, it's the way that I'm photographing, and how they relate and how they make it um, a photograph. So it, it's more than just their identity, it's more than just, it's the whole thing. And uh, yeah, that's primarily uh, what my practice is at the moment. Thanks very much, Darren. Um, Thanks everyone. Um, last night TJ Clark asked the question, do landscapes have identities? Um, and we're very privileged to hear his analysis of that question um, over, uh, in re reflecting upon a work of Cezanne. Um, I think today we've seen indeed that landscapes contain multiple identities and histories and stories um, as reflected through the work of four artists um, from various perspectives. Um, I'm wondering if there are any questions from the, from the floor, um, if people have any questions for the, for the panellists and speakers this afternoon. So I wonder if you know that in just an hour out of Melbourne, the forests are being logged the same yeah, yeah. way as they're doing it in yeah. Tasmania, yeah. No, in I'm, the I'm, central highlands? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, um, I only wanted to talk about this one work today, but I've made three other works in relation with the Wilderness Society, so I'm, yeah, I follow all of their campaigns nationally, so I do understand the, the Browns Mountain camp, um, yes. area in Victoria is currently like one of the hot areas here. Yes. Um, I've been involved with the Wilderness Society as well, yeah. that's why I, yeah. I guess it res your work resonates so strongly, yeah. so thank um, you. <laughs> I mean, partly why I, uh, th there's this question, I mean, the way you've asked that question in relation to, often comes up as well, that because Tasmania is such a high profile um, place um, for the Australian conservation movement in terms of, you know, the Franklin campaign and Lake Pedder and the kind of history of um, environmental politics in Australia. So it often gets a kind of focus um, which other areas don't get. Um, but the, the reason for me making the work there is just that it was, um, it was easy for me to do it because I'm, I'm not a, I don't drive. So I, I, it, there's a kind of support network there of people who, because I've worked with them in the past, have um, enabled me to make the sort of work that I was able to make this time with walking through Clearfells. 
Uh, sorry, um, can you wait to the microphone? Thanks very much. Um, Peter Cuff from Artists for uh, Climate Action. Um, it's interesting as we, um, we, we make the, the societal transition towards a, uh, a more ecologically conscious society and, and start to um, um, reconsider how we um, have overly plundered um, the ecosystem and, and treated it as, a, um, as a, uh, an ec ec economic resource um, rather than something valuable within itself. I think implicit within it, this process, this transition, is a paradigm shift to a, a more non-anthropocentric way of interacting with the environment. And I'm wondering if there is some kind of a, um, a paradox uh, within that um, paradigm shift conceptually in that um, uh, the question of uh, human identification with um, the environmental other, um, how can that be non-anthropocentric? It's a, a big question. <laughs> um, is there, who would like to take that on? I, I think it, for, I mean, from my perspective, it um, comes back to that um, multiple history, multiple kind of ways of identifying the landscape and, and all those multiple viewpoints are what interest me, I suppose, when I'm making work. But I don't know if that answers your question in any way <coughs> at all, but that, that's, that's my perspective from now and, and having that, you know, that, yeah, the environmental movement and where it's, where it's where it's at now, which is its centre centre stage, basically, isn't it? In, in politics, etc. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's something you can't ignore. <laughs> I mean, possibly, I think in the case of um, each of the artists, their work takes on various forms, and sometimes their work engages with from a more personal perspective, at other times it engages with a more political, public perspective. And in Raquel's case, also, I think her work and Tom's and each of the artists have also engaged engaged with the challenge of actually taking a political position and the effective, effectiveness of doing so, you know, and balancing that against the effectiveness of, of what, is, what makes a good artwork. Um, so I think that's... Yeah, I mean, you often see the kind of unhinging of an um, anthropocentric uh, look at in, um, the, of, of the natural world through a kind of investigation of the relationship between animals and humans and using, kind of trying to use animals as a way of unhinging language and... Um, unhinging uh, human experience, um, which is kind of interest. It's kind of interesting how that then that the animal actually doesn't appear very much in conservation um, artworks or camp. I mean, it appears a little bit in conservation campaigns, but not nearly as much as images of landscape. And um, it's one of the things I've, I've sort of been thinking about in relation to documents and language, and which I think all of the works that um, were that was spoken about today had some kind of relationship is that there's some way in which the main um, point of conservation work or works which are trying to address our relationship with the environment is that it's a, trying to uncover things that haven't been spoken about in quite um, that way. And so um, language became, as in spoken language, remains really important and that's why it, it tends to feel as if the artworks are um, kind of um, sitting within an anthropomorphic kind of anthropomorphization of landscape. Um, but instead, you could maybe just think about it as being uh, rather, they're all nevertheless skeptical of human relationships with nature. So, Patrick. Patrick McKay. Um, I'd like to ask the panel as a whole, what struck me in all of your presentations, and they were all uh, extraordinarily vivid, um, and indeed landscape does seem to lie at the heart of your practice or part of your practice. But I noticed that whenever, if you'd like, you step into the landscape or begin to use it, there's a clear sense of the social dimension of what's happening in the landscape. Mm. Social even to the point of political, as Max said a moment ago. 
And I wonder if that social dimension is what you feel that your gener separates your generation and its view of the landscape from all those generations of landscapes that have come before you, from um, indigenous artists to John Glover to Jan Sandbergs and Catherine Hattam and John Wolseley. I mean, is that the thing which you feel your generation has to offer, which is strikingly new in addition to the great tradition of Australian landscape art? <laughs> I, I mean, I wouldn't want to answer that question on behalf of a generation, um, <laughs> but um, it's, um, I mean, I would um, say that for me, to use the example of that particular work that I showed, um, Monument for the Flooding of Royal Park, what is primarily interesting for me is Burke, Burke's, in particular, Burke and Mills' inability to see. I mean, and that's an inability to see the landscape it, without a veil being in front of you. But it's also an inability to read a social situation. And I would use a non-visual metaphor here, an inability to listen. I mean, that ultimately is a, a form of self-obliteration in their case, in that they, they're consigned to finishing their days gorging on a food which debilitates their digestive system. And in that sense, there is a kind of buried in there, I hope, I guess, is a kind of allegory which is par primarily social in nature, which attempts to extract from that narrative something for us now, which is more of a social nature to do with a blindness in seeing something about how our, our society is. But I, I guess that for me at least, and I don't know whether it's the same for the others, those social questions have environmental ramifications, obviously, in the, and the environmental ramifications of the way that we live is one of the primary questions that we face. So hopefully that interest in the social is also one that spills into an environmental <coughs> question or a, a question which involves landscape. Darren, do you have any thoughts on... Are you going to say something? I think probably all Sorry. were. Are you, yeah, I thought you're next. <laughs> okay, Darren. Well, I was just thinking in uh, relation to um, uh, what Darren and Tom were talking about, also um, this, like looking to other other locations whilst you're in the location. So there's these, I keep saying multiple, but, you know, like um, Darren was talking about having, you know, coming from a multicultural background. And so there's so many different perspectives that come into that. And I don't know if that's, yeah, this particular generation, but, you know... We all have close friends from all around the world and you can contact them quite easily and quickly. Perhaps that has something to do with it. Not, but yeah, like Tom, I don't really want to talk on behalf of a whole generation. I, I would probably think that, um, that in this generation we are more, more culturally aware of the social involvement and the social, social interaction, particularly from a cultural perspective um, that existed. I, I would, uh, from, from where I stand, I, I think um, there is so much more awareness that, uh, that um, people can associate, not necessarily just to the land, but they're associating to, uh, I guess, the people of the land and their particular relationships with that. Uh, uh, to me, that, that is a, a more evident, um, not, not saying that, that uh, they're they're totally there. But um, I, I certainly think that there's more understanding um, in relation to that, perhaps, than ever there was. Uh, I think that's, that's certainly coming through, particularly with um, more, I guess, media, more, you know, it, the information is out there uh, in, in a greater way. The, um, the Aboriginal map of Australia, which breaks down every, every pretty inch of, of, of Australia into Aboriginal country and, uh, you know, to each nation as they are, um, you know, is, is another way that uh, um, has, brings in a social element um, to all of the landscape. Um, uh, you know, pretty much everywhere you go, uh, in, in each major city, there's probably a, not, not just a Melbourne name, but there's an introduced, there's an Aboriginal name that's given to, the, to that land. Um, and uh, that's pretty much true you know, all over the place. So there is that social element that is definitely coming in. And, um, and I would probably think that that's probably going to continue. Um, I think um, 
the idea of social context is, and artists working within social context is something that our generation of artists received at art school. If I think of, you know, Lu Lucy Lippard's work from the 70s and the feminist movement, they're all this kind of um, a point where social context became really important. And certainly when, you know, just when I finished my degree, Hal Foster um, published Return of the Real, and there's that great explanation. He talks about the tension of con current contemporary practice where there's a kind of tension between horizontal practices, practices which work across sites and across locations. So, you know, the sorts of works like Tom's work or some of the things that um, Darren had showed, and then works which have a kind of vertical axis, which are returning back to artistic models in the past and bringing them, working them, reworking them and bringing them into the present. So there's a kind of um, horizontal and what he describes a vertical practice and that you know because all of these practices are kind of existing at this this point there's this cross um, uh, you know a, a knitting of those two a divergent approaches in so that there are works which are looking at social context but are also have a kind of highly um, uh, literate view of, of art history so I think that's not necessarily particular to our generation, but it's certainly particular to the education that our generation may have received at art school. Uh, is it time for one more question? Is there any, any further questions from the floor? There's one here in the middle, Catherine. Uh, <clears throat> Catherine Hatton, I'd like to ask Tom Nicholson if if uh, there's in his practices there's something equivalent to the Ian Byrne where you're doing one thing but in fact something else is happening. If in fact you do really love that piece of landscape that you use for the Burke and Wills, that there's something that comes across that's more than just the story. Where Ian Byrne is doing something but in fact there's some other thing comes out in relation to the Fred Williams kind of thing. I think that that constantly occurs, that um, what you've just described where something is animated in your work by some idea um, which initiates something or an idea of what you're doing and then because you're making a thing and not writing an essay, what asserts itself is something which you are not completely conscious of or utterly unconscious of or is simply an accident that you happily receive as grace. Um, and so I think it's hard to imagine a work where that doesn't occur in some way. And if you're making a picture, it happens in the way that a picture is discovered. But equally, I think, as Ian Burns' work shows, that in the most apparently cerebral and controlled work of art, those things assert themselves constantly. And that's the sense in which artworks discover things that uh, are, useful, are not just interesting to look at, but also useful in giving us understandings we may not reach without those intuitions or without serendipity. So, um, I mean, I would say that that unconscious thing is present in the thing I showed in that there are a whole lot of things I didn't really consciously think about and which I became aware of the more <coughs> I sat with what I ended up with. Um, and particularly when you have the opportunity to show something a couple of times, every time you put it in a different context or form, so it gives you something else that you weren't uh, aware of and that's I think is what is rich about the process of, of making an artwork that that, that that is allowed to occur. Question. Uh, firstly, up here on, on the aisle, and then um, yeah, up in the top. Thank you. Uh, my name's Edward Coleridge. I just want to ask the, the contrast between this afternoon and this morning. The, it's about materials. Um, I suppose one used the word ma traditional materials this morning and untraditional uh, photography this afternoon. Can you, any of you talk about that? The, the, the actual handling of paint and uh, charcoal and... Uh. I mean, I was just going to say, um, I mean, the tradition of cinema is at least 100 years old, so I don't really think, and I certainly think the work I made um, connects to cinema and the idea of the view and the camera and the camera's eye, and um, although it was kind of 
the downward, the downward eye, the downward pointing camera is much more to do with the satellite than. Uh, than but there, uh, you were dependent on the helicopter pilot. You said. Sorry. You were. De yeah. De dependent on the on helicopter, the helicopter pilot. pilot. Yeah, for for one channel of the the three, uh, but that. Um, one of the things that I think is common to all of us here is that we don't, I mean, it might be that the work that was shown today was primarily document, um, using photograph, but, um, you know, the last, the work I made before that was a series of, you know, quite extensive drawings. So I don't think about, I think that probably the really big difference for uh, people like um, our generation who've gone through art school in the 90s is that there was just a lot more, um, there were more open kind of um, disciplines so that uh, you might have done f painting but you also might have done photography or, you know, certainly the, the, the fact that, um, you know, video cameras, every household has a video camera because they're, you know, recording their grandchildren or they're interested in making movies. So that all of that kind of um, technology became much easier to use. Um, Certainly, um, Rosalind Krauss has referred to the post-medium condition in which artists work today. Yeah. But um, I think, indeed, people do work in a generally interdisciplinary approach. Um, Raquel makes beautifully, you know, observed, closely observed uh, drawings of after nature and um, from the motif, as well as making works which make problematic the whole question of representation itself. Mm. Um, Tom came out of the drawing department at the VCA, many people, I think, gravitated to the drawing department because it actually was perhaps the most lateral um, area in the art school, which wasn't bound specifically to a particular medium condition. Um, so I think that's possibly, you know, a situation in which artists are working today. Um, we have one last question, um, an opportunity for one last question, I think it was here um, in the front, <coughs> and then um, we have, I look forward to inviting Patrick up to join us. Thank you. Grace Davenport. I just have a question um, in sense to 21st century art and it's focused on ecology and obviously the landscape which um, we have been speaking about today. I guess I'd like to, um, to focus on the fact that, or to raise the question whether our generation is subconsciously making perhaps a memorial for our natural landscape um, with the rise of the uh, the technological society which we're now living in and we're now sort of, um, we're directed by and sort of immersed within. So, so I guess my question is, are we making a memorial to our natural landscape as we're gradually losing it or perhaps it's becoming superseded within an electronic world? And your thoughts on that? No, you're making memorials. You can answer that question. Yeah, memorial. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that I can quite answer that question, but I would say this, that um, I'm resistant to a certain aspect of making memorials, although I find myself constantly making them. <laughs> um, and that is that it always, and I would say the same of working with archival forms, that it always risks being a kind of refuge from the present and from the future. And that in a way, these memorial and monumental and archival forms are only interesting if they help us also to envisage into the future. And to make a memorial to our natural environment would suggest a, a kind of um, resignation to its destruction, which I think, I mean, uh, John spoke very eloquently about this this morning, that there is in his um, very loving attention to what's extraordinary in our natural environment, um, a desire and a belief in not destroying it. And I mean, it, it, Max mentioned that my home discipline of um, drawing. And one of the things which I think is most interesting about drawing is it's simply about attending very, very closely to the, what the world is. And that that suggests the necessity to, to envisage ways to make sure that that richness still exists. So I, that, um, I wouldn't think of it as a memorial to our natural environment. Hopefully we haven't got to that point yet. <laughs> Perhaps memory is a wonderful place where we can conclude. I think, um, indeed, um, I think we've clearly seen that you know the idea of history and identity is strongly embedded within the landscape itself, but also within the attention that artists bring to that landscape. So I'd like to um, uh, invite Patrick McKechnie to say, but firstly, if you would well, um, please join me in thanking Darren Seavey, Raquel Miller, Sue Hayes, Tom Nicholson.
Now it gives me a great pleasure to welcome back to the stage the master of the ceremonies and the um, director of the festival, Patrick McKaki. Well, in one sense, by thanking this panel and this marvellous chairman, Max Delaney, uh, you really are thanking all the panels and all the speakers who have taken par part in the la last week. Um, uh, we also, in turn, we would like to thank you as rare representative of the extraordinary appreciative and responsive audiences we've had throughout the week. In fact, you seem to me the brightest of all the audiences we've had. And why we've had to wait till the very end to meet you is just a modest grief of ours. Um, but there are two people I would, two groups of people I would like to think. First of all, uh, a festival of ideas is a great idea in itself. And that idea uh, comes from uh, the Vice Chancellor of this university, Glyn Davis, uh, who has supported this uh, festival uh, both times in its instances uh, and by his presence uh, at it. Um, he unfortunately was tied up with a much more exciting topic this week with the university's budget, uh, and uh, so it only comes sporadically. But we are delighted and welcome you here, and we thank you for this great gift you've given to the people of Melbourne. I should like to say that I live in New Haven. It's a wonderful place to live. Uh, but I have to be something of an absentee landlord uh, with this festival. And it would not happen were it not for an extraordinary deputy director I have in Jaisal Shaw. Not for nothing and not lightly is she called the Leaderine. And uh, her word is law. And uh, she not only, when I say she's the nuts and bolts of the festival, she actually fashions the nuts and casts the bolts, which fit in and make this festival run and hold together. And without her, we could not exist. But beneath her, there is a regiment of extraordinarily disciplined women who run the festival as well. Um, I'm glad to see that Ros Holloway is still here, because I was sure she was going to be kidnapped by at least one of our keynote lecturers. She gave such wonderful attention uh, to them. To Elise Fogoni, we owe our uh, dinners and our social side, and um, uh, Monica Buller Valencia uh, is one of the people who will endlessly keep you up to the mark without for a moment bullying you. And we are grateful to for Simone Traglia, uh, who has been the calmest presence amongst this red regiment of women. But the festival really owes itself to these people who are normally anonymous. And lastly, we have had the most wonderful ushers who have been patient, smiling, even when they know they've got to do an exam in the afternoon. And we thank, 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 thank them. So. Vice-Chancellor, do you think I can say that we look forward positively to seeing you all back in two years' time at the third Fe Festival of, of, of Ideas? I've just been given the uh, papal nod, so yes. 